Okay, so exam review here, guys, for unit four, okay? Simple harmonic motion and waves. So the first thing we went over in this unit was simple harmonic motion. And on the first day, we talked about the principles of simple harmonic motion. If simple harmonic motion is going to occur, then the restoring force okay, has to vary linearly with displacement. Okay, That had to be true in order for simple harmonic motion to occur. Then we talked about two examples of simple harmonic motion. So we looked at a pendulum and a mass on a spring. And we looked at the factors that can affect their period. Okay. For a mass on a spring, okay, we found that the period was affected by the mass and the stiffness of the spring. For a pendulum, and we confirmed this with a lab, we found that the period of a pendulum is affected by length of the pendulum and the acceleration due to gravity. So expect that there could be a multiple choice question, maybe two, about the principles of simple harmonic motion. There will definitely be written response problem solving items about simple harmonic motion, calculating the period of a pendulum and a mass on the spring. Okay. Those aren't difficult problems, but they'll definitely be there. Yeah, you have to square everything if you're going to manipulate something out from underneath. Yep. Yes. Okay. Then we talked about Hooke's Law. Okay, remember that Hooke's Law calculates the restoring force that we were talking about in the first one here. And that is negative K times X. Okay, the negative sign, remember, is there to make sure that the force has a vector that is always opposite the displacement. If I stretch a spring to the right, the spring needs to pull to the left. All right, so that's what Hooke's Law always talks about, is the restoring force in a spring. Problem solving questions to do with Hooke's Law will only involve how many points? One, okay? It's not gonna talk about an oscillation and ask you to compare this place and this place because that would be what kind of a question? A conservation of energy question. Most likely, Hooke's law is gonna deal with a hanging object because that's the way Hooke did his experiment. Okay. It's essentially how spring scales work. Okay. If you hang something from a spring scale, it's using Hooke's law to tell you what the mass of the object hanging on it is, because obviously the spring constant of the spring in it is known. All right, And it's just using the displacement to calculate the mass that's hanging from it. All right. Everybody okay with that? Yeah? All right. Um, so expect that there could be a multiple choice question about this, but there's definitely going to be a problem solving item to do with just Hooke's law. All right. Okay. Then we talked about conservation of energy. All right. So remember, conservation of energy is always the same. It's mechanical energy initial equals mechanical energy final. You could get a conservation of energy question that's a pendulum. If you do, then the potential energy is gravitational. If you get a mass on a spring, then the elastic, then the potential energy is elastic, all right? Uh, if it's the latter, remember that elastic potential energy is one half kx squared. Now, the thing we need to remember about conservation of energy for a mass on a spring is that we're dealing with slightly different positions. All right, so if I'm dealing with this position here where the spring is compressed, it's maximum amount. What do I call that spot? I call it the maximum amplitude. amplitude, okay? That's probably a term that will come in in a question like that, okay? So in this case, X is at its maximum and we sometimes say that it's just A, all right? The kind of energy it has here is potential only because it's not moving here. This is where it stops instantaneously before going back towards equilibrium. 
Okay, so we've got that. Um, then we could have a position that's like here where it has both kinds of energy. Okay, could have kinetic and potential because it's not at its maximum amplitude, but it's also not at equilibrium. Okay, so the red line here will be the equilibrium position. When the object is at the equilibrium position, my spring's going to end up looking pretty straight by the time it's stretched all the way. Okay, um, when it's at the equilibrium position, it only is going to have kinetic because that's where the spring is neither stretched nor compressed and isn't exerting any force anymore. Okay, um, So it'll have only kinetic there and it'll often say something like the maximum speed of the object and you just have to understand that the maximum speed of the object occurs at equilibrium. Okay, And then out here, okay, we'll say at the maximum amplitude in this direction, it would only have potential energy and if there was a spot in between, then obviously it would have both at that position and the question would simply ask you to compare both and probably to find either the displacement or the speed okay or something like that okay we've done a bunch of those like a bunch of questions like that you guys didn't have any trouble with those so it shouldn't be an issue okay questions on conservation of energy okay then we went to properties of waves okay about waves there are two kinds. Okay, we got transverse and we have longitudinal. Obviously, you need to be able to identify what type of wave you're dealing with. A multiple choice question could be something like what kind of wave would have the medium displaced perpendicular to the direction the wave would travel, A, B, C, or D, something like that. Okay, just making sure you understand the terminology. Um, properties of waves that we also have to remember would be things to do with the nature of the wave. Transverse waves have crests and troughs. Longitudinal waves have compressions and rarefactions. Okay, so again, terminology. Okay, terminology will be important. Those are the words I'll use when I'm describing things. Okay, um, what do we call the amount of time it takes for a wave to make a cycle? The period of the wave. What about how many waves per second? Frequency. Okay. Um, Maximum distance the medium goes from equilibrium. Amplitude. Okay, remember it's the same terms that we used for masses on springs and pendulums and things like that because these are still something moving with simple harmonic motion. Okay, the medium is oscillating with simple harmonic motion, so we're still going to be using similar terms. Okay, uh, things that are going to be uh, new would be things like wavelength. Okay, lambda. Okay, the length of one cycle. So a transverse wave goes like this, right? So it looks, right? That's a transverse wave, whereas a longitudinal wave is a compression followed by a rarefaction, followed by a compression, right? So back and forth, back and forth. Yeah. Emily? Sound. Sound's about the only one we've gone over. There are there are earthquake waves that are also longitudinal, but we didn't really talk about them. Okay. Sounds the most common longitudinal wave. Okay. All right. Yeah, if I move the slinky back and forth like this instead of up and down, then I got a longitudinal wave. Yeah. Okay. And, I and we're going to probably have some time on Wednesday. Uh, I kind of have planned some time to just have the, all the slinkies out and have you guys do some things so you can actually observe the wave properties yourselves. Okay, So I'll be telling you what to do with the slinkies and you'll do it. And you can video it if you want and have, have that to study from as well. Okay. All right. Uh, fifth thing, universal wave equation. So V equals F times lambda. It is highly unlikely there would be a multi-mark problem in the written response about universal wave equation. However, it is part of interference. It's part of air columns. 
it's part of standing waves, okay, um, things like that, right? It could also be integrated into like maybe an echo question, you know, or the, you know, a person's on a boat and this many waves or this many crests go by. I, I could work it into something like that, okay? But I'm not going to have a, here's the frequency, here's the wavelength, calculate the speed question in the written response, maybe in the multiple choice, okay? But um, this would be used as part of something else in a written response item. Okay, so you could very likely have something like I've just mentioned, you know, a person in a boat or, you know, um, this many waves goes by or whatever, something along those lines or an echo question because we dealt with those as well. And so expect some kind of contextual question like that involving the universal wave equation. Okay, remember that the other way you can write this is lambda over T, okay, because T equals... 1 over f and f equals 1 over t. Okay, it's a formula that will come up occasionally on the exam. Okay, after universal wave equation, we talked about interference. Remember, interference is what happens when two waves occupy the same space at the same time, also known as the principle of linear superposition. If you recall in class, there were several times where I gave you two waveforms and asked you to draw the resulting waveform. Or I asked you at this point, is constructive interference or destructive interference occurring? Okay, expect to be tested in a similar fashion okay, um, on the unit exam okay, in that way. And I think I actually told you one day in class, I'm going to give you a question where I have pictures of two waves overlapping and asking you to count, to draw the resulting waveform and tell me whether it's constructive or destructive. Okay, that's just one of the ways I'm going to test you about your knowledge of interference. Okay, the other type of interference question we went over was the two speaker question. Okay, and we had to figure out whether the person heard a loud or quiet sound based on where they were standing, right? Uh, and so things we would need to know, okay, or things that affect whether this person hears a loud or quiet sound are, okay, the number of wavelengths traveled, actually it's the difference in the number of wavelengths traveled, okay, from sources to person. Okay, if this here is three and a half wavelengths and this is one and a half wavelengths, does the person hear a loud or quiet sound? Loud. Okay, the difference in travel is two wavelengths. Okay, that's two whole wavelengths. So these things would be arriving in phase. That's another term you probably want to be familiar with, in phase or out of phase. Okay, and thus that person would hear a loud sound. What you have to do in order to calculate that, right, you'd probably have to do a Pythagorean, Pythagorean theorem calculation. You'd have to do a universal wave equation to get wavelength, okay, and things like that, right? But I would expect slash guarantee that you will see a question like this one, okay, on the unit exam because we did three of those, I think, in class. Okay, so expect that you'll see one like that. Okay, hey, after we talked about interference, we talked about wave behavior at a boundary, right? So when waves go from one medium to another, what about them changes? Their speed can change because speed is controlled by the medium. What else changes? Amplitude can change. What else? Wavelength, right? If speed changes, wavelength has to change. That's how frequency stays the same okay so that's things to remember other things to remember would be okay if i have a question like this where i have a wave approaching a fixed end okay its reflection will be right inverted right and go back the other way um or i this is the before picture and this is the after picture okay um, so this is going backwards, that's going forwards, that's going forwards. Is the second medium more or less dense than the first? Less. Okay, how do we know? Okay, longer wave means it's going faster. And 
the reflected wave was upright. You would need to mention both of those things as a justification for that answer. Okay. Or if it was a multiple choice question, both of those things would have to be right in the answer stem. Okay. So make sure you read the whole answer stem. Okay. Just in case it's like, uh, you know, second medium is less dense because the wavelength is longer, but the reflection is inverted. Like read the whole thing. Okay. Because it might have two pieces of information in it. Some people just read the first part and go, I like that one. And it's right. And not read the rest. Is that a big enough hint? It's almost like I wrote the test and I know what things are on it. Oh, wait, I did. <laughs> okay. Um, and then we have standing waves, All right. So expect you, you're definitely going to have like an air column question, okay, in the written response part. Um, and there'll probably be some questions about standing waves in the uh, multiple choice. Okay. Remember, one of the big things is being able to determine how many wavelengths there are based on like a wave pattern. So you know, th this could be an easy multiple choice question. Okay, here's a standing wave pattern. This distance is eight meters. What's the wavelength? Four meters. Okay, how do I know that? Because there's two wavelengths there. Okay, there's one wavelength. Okay, there's two wavelengths. Okay, that's an easy multiple choice kind of question that asks, do you understand standing waves? Can you use a universal wave? Well, not really universal wave equation, but okay, can you understand the, the idea of wavelength and things of that nature? Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, air columns, diagrams on standing waves. Okay, those kind of things will definitely be on the unit exam. And then lastly, sorry, not lastly, air columns. I already talked about those. Lastly, Doppler effect. Okay. Uh, sorry, let's talk about air columns a little bit more. If I have um, that formula, I am dealing with closed air columns at their fundamental, fundamental frequency. Okay. This is the one for open air columns. Closed air columns only resonate when? Right, at odd numbered frequencies, because at their even numbered frequencies, even though there is a wave pattern, it does not resonate, okay? Because it's a node at the top. That's both a standing wave and an air column question, okay? Uh, it might come, in, might come into play in a problem solving question if you were asked to calculate the next frequency you would hear, okay? The next, if, if, you ha if you calculate the fundamental frequency and it's an open air column, the next frequency you would hear is F2, but if it's a closed air column, the next frequency you would hear would be F3, just things like that, right? Little things that could come up. Okay, and then we talked about Doppler effect yesterday. There's a couple of multiple choice questions about your understanding of Doppler effect, like situational, you know, person's got a train approaching them, is the frequency higher, lower, the same, whatever, okay? Um, and then there is a Doppler effect problem solving question. You guys didn't seem to have much trouble using this formula yesterday, so expect that I'm going to ask you to solve for something using that formula, probably not F, okay, um, on a written response item. Right. Okay. Um, other things to remember, this might come up a bunch of times too. Okay. If a question gives you the temperature of the air, you're going to have to use that to calculate the speed of sound. Okay. Could come up occasionally. Okay, that's what's on there. There are 14 multiple choice questions. The shortest of all the exams in terms of multiple choice. Many of them have diagrams, like um, half of them. And there are um, nine written response items. Okay, and their the written response items are um, interference, uh, air columns, um, like universal wave equation stuff, uh, pendulum, uh, conservation of energy, mass on the spring, Hooke's law. Doppler and interference. Okay. 
All right, anything you want me to go over in more detail? Okay, uh, using the Doppler effect formula? Okay, so let's think back to this so that we under so we don't just memorize, but we understand, right? If the object is approaching me, this is greater than this. The only way I get F to be greater than FO is if what's in brackets is greater than one because I'm multiplying, right? The only way I get this to be greater than one is if I make the bottom smaller. So I would be subtracting, okay? If it's, a pro, if it's retreating, then I'm gonna add because I want the bottom to be bigger. So I get a decimal and then I get a smaller F than FO. Remember, it's always an integer multiple. F3 is how many times greater than F1? Three times. Yeah, right? If F1 is 10, F2 is 20, F3 is 30. Okay, it's always a multi it's always the multiple of the of the F. Just multiply it by three. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so if I want to get VS by itself, and let's say we have um, a retreating object. So it's plus, okay. Uh, the first thing I want to do is divide both sides by FO. Okay, so FO comes over there. That gets rid of my brackets, okay. VS is on the bottom. I don't want it there. So I'm going to flip both sides, okay. Rules of algebra say I can do whatever I want to an equation as long as I do it to both sides. So I have FO over F equals V plus VS over V. So now I'll multiply both sides by V. And then I'll add, or sorry, then I'll subtract uh, V over to the other side. So what I end up with is FOV over F minus V equals VS. Okay, if it's an approaching object, then it'll be V minus FOV over F. That'll give me the other one. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Pendulum? Yeah, pendulum? A pendulum question. Okay. I was like, okay, I don't remember my math or parabolas. Okay. Um, all right. So a pendulum question. Um, I have no idea what this is going to work out to be, but we'll try it. Okay. Um, so what's the acceleration due to gravity at a location where a 0.65 meter pendulum has a period of 0.75 seconds? Okay. So they've told me the period is 0.75 seconds. Okay. That could come in a number of different ways. I could also have told you the frequency, or I could have said it makes this many oscillations in five seconds and had you have to calculate period that way, something like that. Okay, But just for the sake of going a little faster, we'll just do it this way. Uh, we know the length is 0.65 meters. So T equals two pi times the square root of L over G for a pendulum. If I'm solving for something that's underneath the square root, I have to square everything before I move anything. So t squared equals four pi squared times L over G. And then I just cross multiply T and G. Okay, so that'll give me um, G equals four pi squared times L over T squared. So for this question, that would be four pi squared times 0.65 meters divided by 0.75 squared. Whoops. 
whoops. I was like, wow, I really screwed that one up. Oh, I took the answer, not the entry. Stupid. Okay. Uh, so we got 25.660974144 divided by. You're crushed here. You're crushed here. It is some pretty strong gravity. It still makes me feel like I did something wrong, but that's just the way it is because I pick numbers out of my head and that's never good. Okay. Obviously on the test, your answers will make sense. Not you're standing on the sun and not frying, but being crushed or watching a pendulum go back and forth. if the amplitude increases. So if I have, so if I've got this set up and I've got um, wave, wave one and I've got um, wave two, they're in phase. When one is up, the other is up, that's constructive, okay? My resulting waveform will be the sum of the two, right? So it would look, well, not quite like that, but bigger, right? If they're opposite, then it'll be destructive. Yeah. Okay. What else, guys? Info? Hmm? An echo question? Okay. I don't know what letter that was supposed to be. I gotta do some math to make this make sense. I'm not gonna have another one that doesn't make sense. Oh, I switched colors. Sorry, guys. Okay, so you know, a question like this here, okay, if I wanna, it's an echo question because we're using sonar, which obviously uses pings, okay? They send out a ping and the ping travels down to the ocean floor, reflects off the ocean floor, comes back, they detect the ping, okay? Um, so the frequency is 400 hertz, the wavelength is 3.8125 meters, and it takes four and a half seconds to return to the submarine. If I wanna find the depth of the ocean, I'm gonna have to use V equals D over T for that, but what do I not have? I don't have V. Okay, I'm looking for D. I don't have V. So I have to find V. Can I use the frequency and the wavelength to do that? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to go V equals F times lambda. All right, so we'll have our 400 hertz okay, times 3.8125, which should give me 1,525 meters per second. Okay, speed of sound in water is five times faster than air. Okay, 
All right, so now that I've got that, now I have V, I can solve for the depth, except what do I have to remember about an echo? Right, it traveled there and back in four and a half seconds. I only want to know how far it is to the ocean floor. So I either solve for D there and back and divide it by two, or I just divide the time by two right now. Okay, either way will get you the right answer. Right, I'm going to divide the time by two right off. Okay, so I'm going to say 1525 times 2.25 okay, um, seconds. That'll give me the depth of the ocean. All right, so we're looking at a ocean depth of 3.4 times 10 to the 3 um, meters. Yeah, you could say 3.4 kilometers too. Okay, so we uh, we know the spring constants. So K equals 4.5 newtons per meter. Okay, we know the mass is uh, 0.65 kilograms. We know the maximum amplitude is 0 0.80 meters. And, and we know that our final position is 0.35 meters from equilibrium. What we're looking for is the speed at that position. Okay, everyone with me so far? Okay. So this is a question about an oscillating object that is asking me to compare two positions. So it is definitely a law of conservation of energy problem. Okay, so EI equals EF. I'm gonna have uh, my initial position is the maximum amplitude. Okay, so I could just say this, EPI plus EKI equals EPF plus EKF but one of these is zero, okay? And it's this one because initially I'm at the maximum amplitude where the object's not moving, right? So when I start plugging in my uh, formulas here, I'm gonna have one half Ka squared equals one half Kxf squared plus one half MVF squared. All right, so I'm looking for VF. What can I get rid of right now? The halves, halves in every turn. Okay, so I'm gonna get rid of that. One less thing to move around. Okay, uh, what do I do with KXF? Yeah, subtract it over to this side. So I'm gonna have um, KA squared minus KXF squared equals MVF squared. All right, I want VF by itself. Divide both sides by M, square root. Okay, plug in my numbers. So 4.5 times 0.8 squared minus 4.5 times 0.35 squared divided by um, 0.65 kilograms.
All right, so the speed at that point would be 1.8, sorry, 1.9 meters per second. Okay, so not much different than solving for a roller coaster question, just using a different type of potential energy. Okay, I have to do the math first, otherwise it doesn't work. Okay, so we'll do a two speaker question here and this will be the setup for the two speaker question. Okay, the speakers are going to be 6.37 meters apart. Okay, the person will be standing 5.7 meters in front of this speaker. Okay, the frequency being emitted by the speakers is 179 hertz and the speed of the waves is 340 meters per second. We want to determine whether this person hears a loud or quiet sound. Okay, um, so what do I need to calculate first? Yeah, I got to find out how far is it in meters from the second speaker to the person. All right, so I'll do Pythagorean theorem on that. Um, and I think I get 8.55 meters, is that right? Okay, so that side's 8.55 meters. What do I need to calculate next? I need to know the wavelength, okay? Because it's the difference in the number of wavelengths from this speaker to the person and that speaker, the person that determines whether they hear a loud or quiet sound. All right, so the wavelength, okay, will be V over F, 340 over 179 okay, is 1.9, 1 1.899, 1 1.9 meters. Okay. All right, so we've got that. Um, now we can calculate how many wavelengths it is from each speaker by simply dividing them by that number. So we'll take the 5.7, and divide it by um, one point, or sorry, by our answer there, about that little point. All right, so it's three wavelengths on that side. And then do the same thing with the 8.55. Oh, I won't use the answer, it'll use the other one, one point. All right, and that's four and a half wavelengths. Okay, am I hearing a loud or a quiet sound? Quiet, because it's one and a half wavelengths difference. So I would show this step, 4.5 minus three equals 1.5 wavelengths, which equals quiet. Okay. I would want to see that step, yes, as justification. Mm, five or six, something like that. It's based on the number of wavelengths. If it's if it's a decimal, if it's 0.5, then they arrive crest to trough and they cancel each other. If it's a whole number, they arrive crest to crest. I hear a loud sound because it's constructive interference then. Yeah. Okay, what else, guys? You guys were full of good questions this morning. It's awesome. I did. Yeah, okay. Curtis? Yeah, there'll be a yeah, graph paper behind it so you can know the amplitudes and, and get it. And so guys, if I when I do that, okay, make sure you get the amplitude right. Don't just roughly draw it, okay? If this is one and this is four, make sure that the one you draw is five, okay? Don't just draw it roughly because if the amplitude's not right, you'll lose a mark on both sides. The amplitude's gotta be right on both, okay? Here and here, okay? Like I would get no marks for what I drew here, okay? It, other than it was constructive. Okay. One out of three, not good. What would we do for the small stuff like the half wavelengths? Do we have a way to check that? 
Uh, you just have to appro that. Yeah, approximate. You're just, I'm worried about the peaks. Okay. Yeah, the other stuff. I mean, you just kind of make the waveform, right? Oh yeah, because I didn't measure any of these, right? Like that's obviously not right. This is nah, close, maybe. Okay, are those in phase or out of phase? They're out of phase. When one is up, the other is down. So my resulting waveform would be somewhere in there. It would be destructive interference, yeah. Yes. I said that four times today. Okay. What else? Okay. Uh, so you got a few minutes left here working on that review package, guys. Uh, remember, don't do not do the ones on beat frequency or any of the ones on refraction because those are all Snell's law and we don't have to do Snell's law anymore. Okay. Uh, but the rest of them you should be able to do. Okay. Monday, lab on air columns. Tuesday, mini lab on Hooke's law. Okay, Wednesday, uh, playing with the slinkies, okay, a little bit and just finalizing a few things. Um, and we might even start in on our kinematics final exam review that day, okay. Thursday, unit four exam. Friday, I go over that unit exam and talk more about the final, okay. Monday, Tuesday, final exam review, probably dynamics and circular motion and whatever other questions you have. And then we done after that. I do not know that yet. I am okay. So a question like this is obviously a Doppler effect question, right? Because we're talking about a moving source, different frequencies. Okay. And in this case, the train is moving away. So my formula will be the Doppler frequency equals the original frequency times V over V plus V S. Okay, because I have a retreating source. Um, the givens I have are the speed of the source. 18.0 meters per second. I have the um, perceived frequency, 180 hertz. Okay. Um, and I have the air temperature, 15 degrees Celsius. All right, if I'm gonna calculate the actual frequency of the horn, FO, what do I need? Right, I need the speed of sound, okay? And I don't have it, but I can calculate it because I was told the temperature of the air. Okay, so I would have V equals 332 plus 0.6 times the temperature. Okay, so for this question, that will be 341. Okay, so we're looking at 341 meters per second okay, as our speed of sound. Now I want to manipulate to find FO. What do I do with all this bracket stuff? Just divide it over to the other side. So I'll have F divided by V over V plus VS equals FO. So that'll be, whoops, don't need brackets there. Uh, 180 divided by 341 divided by 341 plus 18. Okay. All right, so 180 divided by in brackets, 341 divided by in brackets, um, 358, actually I don't need brackets for that, 358. Yeah. All right, so the actual frequency of the waves is 189 hertz. Okay. Sorry, that should be 359, because I can't add. Which makes it 190 hertz. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. Good. Any others? Oh, right. We were going to do that. Right. <laughs>